this is what I'm going to talk about in two ways. I'll talk about the context, the training, and then um, the approach that we've taken in Blue Shield over the last three years or so, where we have sought very self-consciously to try to um, construct a vision of what uh, military engagement looks like um, on operations, and therefore what do people need to be trained against. I'm going to refer quite a lot to the course that I ran with Tim. Tim was the course director and me as the sort of chief instructor. He designed our, the 10 day course we ran in October, which I think is not quite a global first, but it's certainly a UK, probably a European first since 1945, um, with this training audience here. You can see on this photograph. It's a tremendously exciting opportunity. I'm really grateful to Tim for having made that possible. Um, okay. Why is the convention problematic? Well, the discourse remains very fragmented and immature, and we've heard a bit about this this morning. Um, the many states' parties particularly regard their obligations disc as discretionary, to say the least. Um, and yet, for reasons that Nigel has uh, alluded to as well, we know very well that safeguarding by, by design actually really does work. If it didn't, we wouldn't have St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, where there was a plan to, 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 to uh, safeguard it and it worked. The Herman Goering Parachute Panzer Division moved the movable cultural property from Naples collections out of Monte Cassino before the building itself was bombed, so that plan worked. Um, the German state moved to protect the statue of Frederick, Frederick the Great by putting a bunker up around it, and yes, that worked. So, um, planning to safeguard is a viable thing to do. And that lesson from the Second World War uh, has carried forward straight into the heart of the Convention. And yet, cultural property protection as, a, um, as an implied military task uh, has really been dormant since the 50s, and Peter spoke about that briefly this morning as well. So for example, Excise Trident Juncture eight, uh, 2018 in Norway, some 50,000 European troops many of them with boots on the ground. Despite all of that, the, um, the exercise setting does not include the Ministry of Culture as an entity to be claimed in the exercise. So there's nothing to engage with in exercise terms. And even more surprisingly, perhaps, despite all the fact that all those people are maneuvering through Norwegian territory, there was no real world plan to safeguard cultural property. Nor was there an exercise scenario in which to exercise it as well despite the fact that Norway is one of the countries that has the most um, comprehensively uh, sophisticated uh, wartime uh, planning regime you can imagine. Despite all that, the Ministry of Culture isn't there. So, uh, why, why is there a problem? Well, this is my view. Without the pressure of armed conflict in Northwest Europe uh, in particular, um, we have these competing value systems I'm going to talk about that remain in unresolved tension. So there's a lot of talk about CPP, um, yet it doesn't really sort of coalesce. And the vested interests in professional regimes triumphs over the wider good. And here are the sort of reasons why I think that happens. That one of these value systems is legal centric, that you will protect cultural property because the law says you have to. And if you don't, we'll prosecute you. And of course, it's totally valid. And Tim gave us examples of prosecutions. That's UNESCO's dominant narrative, celebration of enacting international law. If it's, uh, I, when the UK ratified, people said to me, that's great. Now our cultural property is protected, to which I say, no, it's not. It's protected in law, but that's a different thing altogether from what happens on the ground. And so what about the heritage-centric view? That, um, in my view, you know, the guardians of heritage police the dominant narrative, reserving the right to judge, the people who don't necessarily accede to their view of what it's all about and how to safeguard it. Um, that's fine on its own terms, but the world is bigger than that. So where does that leave the armed forces? Well, very recently really, and partly through our work at Blue Shield, um, we start to frame it like this. That from a military point of view, CPP framed in the ways I've just described is not actually very useful when you're trying to plan and conduct military operations whether you're thinking tactically, operationally, or strategically. What's at stake for a commander whose task is to conduct operations anywhere across the spectrum of conflict, whether it's peacekeeping at one end or high-intensity warfighting at the other? 
What's at stake for that person? You're trying to do that within, uh, within the laws of armed conflict. Because the 54 Convention lies, is nested within the wider imperative, which is the law of armed conflict. So, lifting a quote from the Protection of Cultural Property and Military Manual that Tim referenced this morning, whether a state is compliant during armed conflict with obligations is about the standards provided by the relevant rules of the law of armed conflict, not the 54 Convention as such. The 54 Convention is nested within it. And what's interesting about the laws of armed conflict is that that regime is permissive within widely accepted boundaries about what's acceptable in the, on, in the battle space. You can do whatever you think you need to do if you can justify it as being necessary. <coughs> And if you do it in a proportionate way, and if you distinguish between civil and military objects, between military and civilians, etc. The LOAC privileges the mission. Uh, it's not proscriptive. And I think that's a very important point. Um, and we see how this percolates throughout the guidance that um, Tim's um, officers were, um, were refer to a lot in their careers. Um, that we find this phrase. Uh, repeated constantly, to the extent that the military situation and other relevant factors admit that we have to take into account the military context in which we're trying to execute cultural property protection, namely a threat-based, intelligence-led context um, where people have to make very difficult subjective judgments in near impossible circumstances. And that's why training is so important. Um, <coughs> So what do we need to do? Well, I think we need to develop a more inclusive discourse. We have to recognise that ministers of defence and their armed forces must be regarded as valid partners, not people to be told what to do and what will happen to them if they break the law, to be regarded as valid partners in the CPP discourse. And that this dialogue must embrace context that everybody understands, whether they're lawyers or heritage professionals, that part of this is about applying means and methods to achieve military objectives, the harsh reality of executing military operations. Um, and so the military component of this discourse, I think, reads something like that, that in order to recognize the value and utility of CPP for the armed forces, and the armed forces have to recognize that it's valuable and has utility. This is the way we have to do it. Actions implicating on cultural property have foreseeable, scalable, cause-effect relationships. Whatever you do or don't do will impact on your mission. And if you incorporate cultural property protection as a planning factor, then you might generate previously unrealised ways and means of understanding and operating. And that might be to your advantage. And if you do those things, then you will almost automatically promote adherence to the 1954 Convention and its obligations, because you're working within the laws of armed conflict, and the two are nested. So here's, a, here's an example, if you like, and this is from the, um, the exercise that ran through the core of Tim's course. So if you think about scalable cause-effect relationships, here's the scenario. Winchester's in enemy-held territory. Very reliable sources report that the old Vine Hotel, anybody been there? Great two listed building in its own right. The old Vine Hotel in enemy occupied Winchester is being used as accommodation for the senior headquarters, the enemy senior military civil headquarters. And their support staff, of course, are having to go and live in the Southern Lettuce, which is down the road, which is also a great two listed building in the centre containing monuments that is the middle of Winchester. With Winchester Cathedral so close by in the centre containing monuments, we need to act in accordance with LOAC, having estimated the possible tactical, operational and strategic consequences of our chosen course of action. So legally, it may indeed be entirely appropriate and um, proportionate to drop a thousand pound bomb right on that headquarters and kill the entire enemy commodity. But, what are the consequences of doing that? Not only tactically, but operationally and strategically. What about winning the peace after the conflict when you destroyed uh, a significant portion of the historic centre of Winchester? Where will that leave you in 10 years time, 20 years time, 100 years time? So the task for the officers on Tim's course 
was to table any CPP factors that they assessed to be vital and bring them to the targeting branch and to do it pretty quickly because we're in the middle of fighting the war. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. So what we're trying to do here is to try to develop a more inclusive discourse and to make it real on the ground, as it were. And the thing that we've been driving at in Blue Shield in particular is this idea that we have to do it together. We cannot train models and say, well, the armed forces must do this, heritage sector does that, states, parties do this. We have to do it together because it's only together that we obtain the kind of purchase that we need in order to safeguard. So the convention looks like this in terms of its obligations. State party, in peacetime, develop inventories, plans, and very particularly, and the convention very hot on this, what are the command and control arrangements for uh, delivering these plans? So that, come the day that you have to transition into armed conflict, you can take operation control, you can activate your measures, you can transport stuff, and you can deploy the distinctive enemies. That's what, basically, that's what the convention is all about. So if you're not operating in your own territory with somebody else's, where there's a host nation, then if you're a deploying force, so Tim's officers, that's what they're looking for. Has this state party done these things? Um, because if they have, we can plug into it. If they haven't, we've got a problem. And by the way, most state parties in the world haven't done any of this. Paid lip service to the convention. And the UK has only done a little bit of this. So these are the um, obligations. Um, this is what we have to do to activate these obligations. That the staff officers, team staff officers, identify opportunities and risks associated with significant cultural property in the area in which they're operating. They must develop crisis driven relationships with the host nation or other states' parties as appropriate, as well as academia and so on. They must, in the end, support the host nation. It's always the only nation who's in charge. How do we support the only nation to protect their cultural property? And we have to factor all of that into a military planning process, because if you can't do that, all of this falls apart. <coughs> and so I just want to challenge Peter Stone, that he said this morning, he says, you know, um, that it's mission first. It, it, it isn't mission first. CPP has got to be embedded in the mission. We have to get away from these kind of binaries or unitary ways of thinking about the subject. We have to think about it holistically as one thing, as a whole. That the challenge, and it's not just a military challenge, it's a heritage sector challenge, is to get your interests represented inside the military planning process. Because that's what saves stuff in the context of warfighting. But of course, this is a significant challenge because we all speak different languages and we have these, these value systems existing in tension. So, you know, heritage specialists will have their own way of thinking about how we conserve cultural property in peacetime going forward. But the notion of threat, of course, is an entirely different thing for people in the armed forces, Tim's, Tim staff officers. And now you start to see why it is that Tim's recruiting heritage professionals, turning them into army officers, because suddenly we can start to close the gap between these two different ways of viewing the world and how cultural property and its protection fits into all of that. So we start to achieve convergence from threat to vulnerabilities to a risk mitigation um, environment where everybody's working together. But that, of course, requires training, and it's not just military training. Everybody implicated in that diagram needs training because everybody needs to understand everybody else and where they're coming from. So when we come to training in collective training, which is training headquarters as teams, uh, how do we start to imagine what this looks like? What does the convention say? How do you turn that into activity um, during an exercise, a command post exercise, where commanders and their staff officers are being exercised? What does command and control look like? How do you achieve command and control um, in conjunction with the host nation, with its heritage sector, its ministry of culture, as well as your allies? How do you actually do that? How do you take control? Well. On an exercise, I can simulate that. I can role play the state party special representative for cultural property protection, an appointment which is uh, established in the 1954 convention, which has a whole raft of clauses 
about command and control in the regulations for executing the convention that nobody ever reads. There's a whole raft of good stuff there. So when I go on a NATO exercise like this, I thought, right, I'm going to try it. It's going to put these guys in a situation where they're going to have to recognise the need to work with the host nation's Ministry of Culture. <coughs> and it works. I write a letter as Ministry of, Minister of Culture to a three-star general, senior general, asking for a one-to-one, -one, and I get a one-to-one. -one. We role-play what it means to represent culture at the highest level during the planning of military operations, something that's never been rehearsed before in Europe since the Second World War. Yet we heard from Nigel about the imperative to get Italian heritage professionals back to work, about the critical issue of getting the host nation alongside you on the same page, protecting cultural property during and immediately after conflict. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. So I'm getting him to think like me about cultural property. So this is training. I'm mentoring a senior general in NATO, exposing him to something he hasn't really had to think about before, and pitching it at that level, I'm educating him. Same uh, with plan, right? So should have plans in peacetime, and there's the, the plans to be activated. What happens if there aren't any plans? What happens if you have to do some mission planning during the early stages of an operation? Well, we can easily replicate that. So on the similar, same exercise, um, I create a situation where the host nation is asking for emergency assistance to evacuate a museum that finds itself unexpectedly in the enemy's line of fire. And it's a museum where the, which, um, where the collections excite a certain amount of sectarian attention. The part of the population loves this museum, and the other half of the population of different, different grouping actively dislike the content, the content of the museum. So here's the challenge. The host nation wants NATO to help to uh, evacuate a museum within range of the enemy's weapons in a town where half the people hate that museum and the other half love it, and where everybody's terrified and hasn't eaten for four days because there's an armed conflict going on. That's the situation in which you're trying to enact cultural property protection. So what does it look like to do that? Now, this I want to um, respond a bit to the question over here from all Air Force about you know, about the, the, the need to train people across the board. This is a massive training liability. If you look at the, um, the table on the left there, that's a Greek headquarters, a Greek sponsored headquarters doing this exercise. That is their planning meeting, and there's somebody there from personnel, there's somebody there from intelligence, because cultural property is an intelligence issue. There's somebody there from counterintelligence, because it's a, it's, a, it's a security issue. There's somebody there from operations, because it's an operational issue. There's someone there from logistics, because it's going to require logistics support to evacuate the museum. There's somebody there from plans, because they've got to write a plan. There's a member of the Royal Military Police there. There's a legal advisor there. There's a liaison officer from the ground holding infantry brigade in his territory the museum sits, etc. That's a planning meeting that went on for about three hours. And all, if you like, all that is about is helping the host nation with mechanical handling, site security, and convoy escort to evacuate part of their collection. And the thing that that meeting isn't about is about wrapping and packing. It's not about the heritage bit. This is security problem set within which the heritage bit is nested. So these are very important questions, but how long do you need to wrap and pack? Have you wrapped and packed? Are, you, are we going to move everything? All the critical stuff. And what do you mean by significant in this case? You mean politically significant? The stuff that one side don't like and the other side love? Or do you mean significant in some heritage-related context of the, the attribution of that? What, what is at stake here operationally? Let me think about doing that. Incidentally, the meeting on the right here with this German headquarters is the first time anything like this was ever tried, I think, since 1954. Certainly in Europe. And of course, I'm training people who are untrained to come back to this question about who needs training. All those people need training to understand what's going, what CPP is and how you activate it. They need to understand that before they come to this meeting. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where I find myself when I go on these exercises where I'm mentoring people who know nothing. So I'm training and mentoring at the same time when we do this, while NATO feels its way forward towards a capability. 
And then you start to see how Tim Tunick fits in. Because what Tim is trying to do is to, re is to replace me by his guys, who can go into a family meeting like that, where people know relatively little about CPP, and they will have a subject matter expert who can guide them. That's, that's what's going on there. Um, get, get within all of this, the centre of gravity of the whole thing is the host nation's Ministry of Culture. The deployed force has no authority to do anything to cultural property. In accordance with the convention, it's the owner's responsibility. <coughs> so, the key enabler for, in all of this is the trained staff force. Tim's people. And um, what they're going to do is this, to assess the mission, mission critical <coughs> CPP factors and very importantly deliver input to the wider planning process. How do you get this into the, into the plan? Um, well, <coughs> conduct an assessment of the CPP factors, which is pretty much all we did on Tim's course for 10 days, learn how to conduct an assessment of CPP factors in a given scenario and to understand how the activity that you're shaping carries with it these scalable cause-effect relationships, the unintended consequences. Again, I might come back to Peter's example. He says, you know, the Brits, in 1917, they put um, Muslim troops around uh, a Muslim, um, around a mosque. Well, was it Sunni or Shia? And so, as soon as you do that, you insert yourself into Ottoman religious politics, straight away, whether you know it or not. Unless you've done the staff work, and you recognise that by protecting the Sunni mosque, you're potentially causing strategic operational level problems, you've solved the tactical problem, but you've created a strategic problem. Other people will see you do that and think that you've taken sides in a historical, long-standing dispute, uh, and you will be implicating the people who have just, the Ottoman Empire has just been ousted from power. You will be like them. So, um, scalable cause-effect relationships and the complexity of culture, its political nuance, is critical to all of this. Um, um, in what way does CPP, can it, can it have operational value? How do you turn it to account for you? Because armed forces people are not interested about whether it has heritage value as such. They're really not, nor do they need to be. They want to know what's in it for them. They, the value and importance connoted by the heritage sector is uh, an underlying factor that informs this. But what is the operational value? So the challenge is to create new ways and means of understanding and shaping and exploiting the, um, the operating environment. Is that weaponizing cultural property protection? Well, um, potentially it is, I think. The challenge is to do it in a benign way, if that's not um, an impossible thing to say. We can maybe talk about that. But you are making people more efficient war fighters. But the efficiency stems from the fact they apply the law on conflict better. So you're making them more moral, perhaps, right? Um, now, so what Tim's guys will be doing is to validate cultural property protection as a necessary task on operations. Not something you have to do because the convention says. Not something you have to do because the heritage community will tut if you land a helicopter on whatever. You'll do it because it will help you get to where you need to go to. It's a necessary military task. And in the process of doing that, you will conform to the convention and do less damage or destruction. So if we take that forward into the, um, in, in, into the training environment, um, one of the first times we had a go at bringing everybody together was um, last year, uh, Coping with Culture, which is an, a German-Austrian exercise run last year in Vienna, um, is that we ran for the first ever pilot attempt to assess cultural property factors, protection factors, um, in a non-conflict scenario of my writing, using the Military History Museum in Vienna, Europe's oldest military museum, using it as a, as a vehicle. And what you see here, um, in civilian clothes, nevertheless, is a mixed blend of heritage professionals, um, armed service people, all of them mid-ranking professionals in their own right. Uh, there's a filmmaker there, 
Um, there are people from across NATO and the, uh, more widely in Europe as well. And they are listening to a curator who's role playing. He's talking about his museum in the context of a crisis. And they're asking him questions about their mission. What does he think is critical for him, <coughs> the host nation? And they're thinking about, well, yeah, but what's critical means for me? Because we need to blend these things. Uh, we've got to pull this together. Conducting a threat analysis. What's a, what are the threats to, the, to, to this collection? In what way is this collection vulnerable? And how can we mitigate the risk? <coughs> so that's what's going on there. Um, and I love that photo because for me this sums it up entirely what we should be doing. This is blended collective learning. Everybody role playing being a military staff officer. Most people there will never be a military staff officer, but they are learning what it means to be a military staff officer and to plan operations. The other half are learning what it means to be a heritage professional. And these these are the kind of questions that come out of that process. And this is the model that. Um, <coughs> we have taken forward into training. Oh, yeah. And I think it was Clive who pointed out that, um, as it happens, uh, one of my, she's a former student of mine at UCL, actually, and she's holding in the brochure in her hands that says Stronger Together. Yeah. That's exactly what we're doing there. Stronger Together. So, just to finish off, I thought I'd just show you a few um, <coughs> snapshots from the exercise that... Um, was the, that ran through Tim's course. Um, so some a sort of visual essay to what this is all about. Military staff officers and host nation stakeholders working together to plan. And then always working, of course, in the context of the, of the mission, of the operation, the military dynamic. Um, starting with this uh, identification of mission critical cultural property. So not all the cultural property, by all means, we're working here in sort of West Hampshire. Um, <coughs> Alex, we were using the um, Historic England database, the real English database, and we just passed out part of the West Hampshire. 300 pages of A4 Excel spreadsheet is what it took just for Hampshire. So out of that, these guys are trying to pass down what's important to the mission, giving it our lay down and what we're hoping to do. Where, where, where's the key stuff as far as we assess it to be? That's what's going on there. And uh, using the, um, the, the database, um, those people who were uh, equipped with the skills were able to lay down precisely where all the cultural property was. And you see the hot spots there around Winchester and Southampton. Um, the people who produce these slides are actually sitting in the audience uh, as students on the course, and they can comment on that later on um, if, if, if they wish to. But for me, this is, this is what good practice really looks like. Um, conducting a threat analysis, no matter what the threat is, and we've, I talked a bit about you know, the, the heritage-centric understanding of what risk or threat might be, and then these military understanding of what threat might comprise. And here we have the enemy's weapons, but we have crime, organised crime, disorganised crime, you know, chaos um, in the battle space, and in the background, all the environmental threats to cultural property that go on as they do in peacetime. All of that's in the mix. Um, <coughs> and again, I think this is produced by people who are sitting in the audience today. But what that allows you to bring to the military decision process is something like this: Winchester Cathedral. Phase by phase, so phase one of the operation is where you are when you're planning. And phase two of this operation is when they go into the attack. So when we attack and we maneuver south of Winchester, what do we assess the threat to Winchester Cathedral to be from a variety of threats? Having assessed its vulnerability and how we might mitigate the risk. So this is the sort of thing you can bring to a planning table and say, look, this is what we need to focus on if we're going to mitigate the risk to cultural property. And there they are doing just that. There they are talking about risk mitigation um, in, on the course. That's, that's the course in action. The other things we spent some time doing is working with host nation experts. Lisa Moll is um, 
at the University of the West of England, she's a ballistic, ballistic damage to stone expert. She's talking about the garrison church in Portsmouth that really was bombed in the 1940s. And she's <coughs> talking about what it is that she can do as a piece of cultural property first aid, you know, pretending that this has just happened. And she was able to say, well, look, this stone is red, it's been burnt. And because it's been burnt, it's friable, it's liable to whatever. And that's what's going on there. And then forging a very strong link between the operational staff work, which is really what is the most important thing here, I think, but also how that translates into tactical action on the ground. So um, assessing the host nation's request for evacuation systems again, at this time within range of enemy artillery and air delivery weapons. And again, I, I want entirely to contest Peter's view that we're never asking anybody to put themselves at risk. I think the opposite is true. Any member of the armed forces within range of the enemy's weapons is always at risk. If we ask someone to drive down the road to go and look at the church, we're asking them to put their life at risk. If we ask them to do any of these CPP related tasks, we have to be honest with ourselves about that. Um, everybody has to be honest about that. We are asking commanders to, to assume and manage the risk to life in order to, uh, to deliver CPP. Because we all of us have the responsibility to respect and protect members of armed services too. Right? It's not just cultural property. Everybody's at risk. And we are asking people to do something dangerous on our behalf. Um, establishing an improvised refuge. Uh, in this case, working with English Heritage at Fort Brockhurst. So we've been to the place where we want to evacuate the stuff, and now we need to get to the place where the host nation wants to store the stuff. And we're talking there with the um, English Heritage professionals. Everybody's in role. They all understand the scenario. We're talking about risk to the mission, as well as to the country of property. Um, and again, uh, in the context of looting and trafficking and first aid, uh, the Royal Garrison Church, again, the English heritage. So in the course of um, Tim's course, we, I think, as we did everything that I was inspired to do. I worked, we worked with the Historic England database, we worked with the English heritage, we worked with the National Trust. We had people from around the world, including Aust you know, Australians, Americans there. We had people from around the world come working collectively understanding what it means to try and protect cultural property from a military perspective, a heritage perspective, a legal perspective, with a focus on the mission, because the people were trained here in military staff officers. And if we, if we can't persuade senior officers that this is in their interest, then it will come to you all. That's the challenge. Okay, thank you very much.